Hey church, how are y'all? Good morning. This is weird. This is a lot of people. Alrighty, I got my list here so I don't stutter and forget. Oh, classic. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I've always wanted to say that. Um, welcome to any visitors who may be here. I'm new too, so we can bond. Um, Bible class will be 10 minutes after the assembly, as per usual, with a first Sunday luncheon following Bible class. Everybody is welcome. Love to see you there. If you're involved with me, meaning if you are a youth or a parent of youth, we are going to have a short meeting following class in the youth room downstairs. I have some stuff to talk to you all about, and I have a little slideshow kind of introducing me with some embarrassing material on it, because I trust you all already. So. Um, Shepherd's Prayer will be led by J.T. Benton and worship leaders Chris Amend. If y'all don't know me, I'm uh, Dino, the new youth minister. I'd love to meet you if I haven't yet, uh, so come say hi to me. Yeah, let's worship. Dino, we're glad to have you. Glad you're here. I was handed this uh, note just a few minutes ago. Uh, Bob Crane handed me this note. His sister-in-law, Barbara Crane, who lives in Granbury, uh, fell and broke her collarbone and three ribs. So please remember Barbara Crane. Would you pray with me, please? Holy Father in heaven, we praise you because you are the creator of the universe. Because you gave your only son as our savior and the head of your church. 
because you sustain us with our daily needs, because you have reserved a place for us in heaven. Father, we seek your blessings for our church family and for our extended family and friends. We have folks battling all kinds of illnesses, some fighting cancer, others recovering from surgery, facing surgery, facing illness with no diagnosis, enduring physical pain, grieving over the loss of loved ones, living a lonely life at home, some giving of their lives as caregivers, others dealing with difficult relationships and all sorts of doubts and anxieties about life in general. Father, in all these instances, we pray for your blessings, for healing, for strength, for faith in the long run. We pray for the medical professionals who treat us. We pray for our efforts to encourage one another. We pray for a strong faith for everyone. We pray for safety and strength as folks navigate all of these various burdens. And Father, we give you thanks for the new births, for health recoveries, for the conversion of new Christians. We give you thanks for this congregation and for the many ministries in which we are involved. We pray that the lost are taught, the poor are helped, and the members are edified. Father, we are hot and dry. We ask for your mercy. We earnestly pray for good rains to soon fill our lakes and reservoirs. <coughs> Father, our country is in the midst of moral decay. Again, we ask for mercy and for our leaders to lead us as you would have them to. Father, again, we praise you as the only true and living God. And we ask all these blessings in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
From the depths of despair, O oh Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, can ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord, yes, I am counting on Him. I have put my hope in His Word. I long for the Lord, more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for within the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He Himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Would you please pray with me? Dear merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here today, Lord. I ask that you would open our eyes and open our hearts so that we hear and, and be able to see what you'd have us to see today, so that we cast away the uh, worldly cares so that we can hear your heavenly word. These favors we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
And good morning, church. This morning's scripture reading will come from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 11, starting in verse 14. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, your brothers, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. To us this land is given for a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Though I removed them far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been in a sanctuary to them for a while, in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. For as for those whose heart goes out to the detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. Then the cherubim lifted their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of God of Israel was over them. Y'all remember the Wizard of Oz, I suppose. Yep. That's what Dorothy said. So when Dorothy and the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Lion finally make it up to Emerald City and knock on the door, right, they get this taste of Oz, of the Wizard, and booming voice and bright colors and demanding expectations, right? Fear, maybe some respect, some intimidation, but maybe, maybe in Oz, this little glimmer of hope, right? That could come, that maybe Oz could do something to help them. So after they go do their deal and get rid of the wicked witch and whatever they do with those flying monkeys and and they go back to the Emerald City. Remember Toto uh, gets loose and pulls back the curtain? And all of a sudden, uh, uh, the wizard is exposed as just a norm, you know, normal guy and not very successful. Right? Uh, you know, sometimes when we peel back the curtain, harsh reality sets in. We have to look at ourselves honestly and look at the situation honestly. And I guess those people in Oz realize things weren't what they appeared to be. So in Ezekiel, beginning in chapter 8 through chapter 11, Ezekiel has another one of those weird visions, sometimes called the temple vision. And what happens in this vision is Ezekiel's been carried away into captivity and in Babylon, he sees the harsh reality of what's going on back in his home in Jerusalem. Uh, and God opens that up to him and kind of peels back the curtain, if you will, of what's going on, especially around the temple. And it's called the temple vision because it, it deals with the temple and God's glory. Back in 1 Kings 8, when Solomon finishes the temple and offers the dedication and brings in the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, there's this attending phenomena that comes that uh, the glory of God comes and fills up the temple and it's so powerful and overwhelming that the priests are in there and they can't serve. they got to leave and go outside. But that glory that's, that's there, the glory of God that's associated with the temple, that's the, that's the Israelites' a kind of assurance coin, if you will. That's their sugar stick. Because as long as they have the temple, and as long as God is dwelling in the temple, then nobody can mess with them. Right? They're good with God. They're in a right relationship with God. And they're going to be protected by God. Uh, and so therefore, you know, they can pat themselves on the back and say, well, we got the temple and we got God. And that lasts for a long time. And so if you'll fast forward about 400 years, there's another priest named Ezekiel who also has to leave the temple, not because of the glory of God, but because of Babylonian captivity 
And God then takes him away uh, to minister to Judah from Babylon, and he becomes a prophet uh, to speak to them and to speak on behalf of God. And what God is doing uh, through Ezekiel as he peels back the, the curtain a bit, he begins to show the harsh reality of what's going on back home. And so back home, uh, there's some choices that have to be made. So part of, the, part of the Israelites, and I would say the best and the brightest and the most promising, the most talented have already been taken away to Babylon by this time. Uh, those who maybe have a stronger affinity towards God are taken away. And those who don't think that they need anything because they got this place called the temple and they have the glory of God are beginning to act in this rebellious way, which we've looked at on the first few chapters of Ezekiel. But there's something else that's going on there. There's this idea of who's right and who's wrong between the two groups, the exiles and the people who are still in Jerusalem. And there's some hard choices that have to be made. So the people that got carried away in, into captivity, God's already made their choice for them. But for the people back home, right, the people who are still hanging around the temple and pretending to love God and be a part of the covenant relationship, they got to make some decisions. And part of it, and these are, these are political and these are military decisions, they're economic decisions. They can partner with Egypt, who's also a power, and try to defeat Babylon. They can throw their hands up in the air and surrender to Babylon and hope it works out. Or they could say, you know what, God, maybe we're a little amiss here and maybe we ought to change and can you intervene? Unfortunately for them, that's not how they saw the world. Because what they believed is the people who were carried into exile were the ones who were wrong. After all, they're not living close to the temple and with the glory of God. They're out there in that pagan world, right, scattered and, and being captive. So they must be the ones who are wrong. And isn't it amazing? It, it never ceases to amaze me how often that we decide we're right and everybody else is wrong based on some rubric that we have created. Can, you know, as I like to tell people, you know, some people ask me uh, if they weren't here on Sunday how the sermon went. The first thing I tell them is, you missed the best sermon I've ever preached. And then the second thing I always say, well, just comparing me to me, I was brilliant. <laughs> it's what we do, right? We create our own rubric of who's right and who's wrong, who's more righteous and who's less righteous, who's closer to God and who's not, who, who's getting this Jesus thing right and who's not. And that's what the Israelites back in Jerusalem do. Well, if you love God, surely God wouldn't take you away to some foreign land. You'd be here where God is, with the temple and with the glory of God. So you know what? We can kind of live how we want to live. We'll do what we want to do. But we know God's with us because God's still here. Well, you know what? Just like in The Wizard of Oz, it's time for Toto to pull back the curtain. Only it's not Toto. It's a prophet named Ezekiel who God speaks through. And the reality is in Ezekiel 8 through 11 is unbeknownst to the people who think they've got it right, and everybody else is wrong, God's glory very quietly but very definitively leaves the temple and moves up to the Mount of Olives and looks over at Jerusalem. Kind of like this guy named Jesus does later and looks over at Jerusalem and weeps and mourns that they are no longer following after what God wanted. Now there's some debate if the glory of God goes to Babylon. I believe that it does because in this text... Uh, God says he's become a sanctuary for the people in exile. And so this rubric that the people in Jerusalem are going by is based on an address, you know, one temple drive, I guess, and based on some kind of custom and some kind of skewed understanding of Torah. It's like this is our get-out-of-jail-free card. Because we've got God and we've got the temple. And there's a new reality, though, that happens in this vision as God peels back the curtain to show, no, this is what the reality is. You guys who think you're right, you're not. 
You guys who think that you're safe because you've got this building uh, and you've got this supposed, whatever this glory of God looks like, you don't. It's the people, actually, who are in exile who I'm trusting now. They're the people that God says I'm going to count on. And what God says in this new reality is, I'm going to gather you up. I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to be redemptive, and I'm going to be restorative, and I'm going to be unifying. And he uses this language of I'm going to give you a new heart. That is, the heart in, in, in the ancient Near East is tied to the mind and tied to the will. I'm going to give you a new way of thinking, a new way to see the world. Maybe that isn't based on some weird rubric of I'm right and you're wrong, but that God's always right. And if you want to live in a way that's going to be beneficial and, and, and be blessed, then maybe you ought to look to what God's saying and God's doing and not your own standards and your own rubrics to give you a new heart and a new spirit that is a new way of living and, and some new energy and what i'm going to do god says to ezekiel is i'm going to bring all these people from who are scattered about because there's already been a captivity back in 720 bc when the northern uh, kingdoms fell i'm going to bring you back and he says what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you one heart as i'm going to bring you together as my people. And I think it, you know, what happens, church, when we are open to surrendering our will to God's will, then God takes that stone heart, right? that heart that's obstinate and stubborn and self-willed and independent, and he creates in us a heart that he calls, that Ezekiel calls a heart of flesh that's pliable and open and has no arrogance and surrenders its will to the will of God and what God's doing and how God's calling. It's a reversal of fortune, isn't it? The insiders are outside. And those who were thought to be wrong actually are right with God. And those who were thought to be outside the scope of God are actually dwelling in God's presence. And those who thought they had it right the whole time are living in this false sense of security. They've got nothing but their own pride and their own arrogance and their own will. Seems like Solomon said something about that, about pride, what happens. That pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Be careful what rubric you use, church, to decide who's in and who's out and who's right and who's wrong and who's closer to God and who's not. Because sometimes we get it wrong. We get it wrong. And what God does with Jesus and he sends Jesus to us is to give us that new heart and to give us this heart and this new spirit that's, that's life-giving and that is hopeful and that is redemptive and it's humble. One that says what Ezekiel says that this remnant will do that he's going to bring back. He's going to give them a heart that will listen to God, that will be self-aware and self-reflective and, and look at the true reality of where you are with God and what this relationship with God is all about. Because I guarantee you, your relationship with God is not about an address on a building. And your relationship with God is not about some custom and tradition that you like or don't like. Your relationship with God is built on the fact that God is gracious and God doesn't quit on you. And God decides who's right and who's wrong, not you and me. And God decides whose presence that he will dwell in. The reality is God's presence is everywhere, and that's part of what this image of Ezekiel, I think, is about. Do we recognize that and do we see that and do we join God in what God's doing? And what God says through Ezekiel and I think says to us, church, and what Jesus says to us when he says that I will be their God and, and they will be uh, my people and, and Jesus says the same to us, I will be their Savior and they're going to be my sheep. What he's saying is I want to give this remnant, which we are a part of, a new heart and a new spirit that beats as one. 
And we do that, church, and we, we develop this relationship with God both individually and collectively through one, putting aside our own self-will because it is destructive, isn't it? And, and putting aside preconceived notions and really listen to God and putting aside the prejudices that we have and, and the rubrics that we use that are outside the scope of Jesus' rubric because only Jesus is going to save the church and only Jesus' grace is going to save. And then we respond just like Israel does. And God says, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to bring them back to this place and things are going to be different. You're going to see the world differently. You're going to see God differently. You're going to see each other differently. You're going to see opportunities differently. You're not going to be so selfishly focused. You're going to be self-aware, but not selfishly focused. And you're going to see all these opportunities that God presents before us as his church to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're going to do that when we collectively come together and we worship and we go to the table of Jesus we're going to do that, what Jesus said. We're going to do that when we show the world how much we love each other. You know, we can't decide that, where am I sitting today? I'm on the east side, so we, uh, I mean the west side. We can't decide that the east church has got it wrong, but the west side has got it right today. Right? We listen to what Jesus says, and we follow his example. And this new heart, church, that God gives us a new, new spirit that Jesus promised. It is life-giving, but it also helps us, and it, it brings to mind truth, and it brings to mind our calling to God, and it brings to mind what we're here about. We're here, church, for the sake of the world to show Jesus that is very much alive and very powerful and very much in us and very active through us. We go serve. And we come together and we treat each other like we really belong to each other. Look, we are pretty scattered. Can I just, can I do an informal poll? Who is here that was born in Burnett County that's still here? All right, now you, who left and then came back? Now, how many of you stayed the whole time? Hmm. Not many, huh? You know what that means? that the rest of us knuckleheads are all from somewhere else. Right? I mean, we got people from states like Oklahoma. From Oklahoma? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we got people from, you know, Tennessee here and North Carolina. And, you know, we got people from deep, deep East Texas and the good part of deep east Texas is the north part where I was from. The rest of you from the southern part, you know, right? Isn't it amazing what God has done? So we got people with way differing levels of education here and different political ideologies and different sociological ideologies. But you know what God has done, church, through Jesus Christ? He's given us one heart. So in this world is dark. This world, it's divided. This world, it is a mess, isn't it? And the only hope this world has is for Jesus' church to beat with one heart. For us to be unified, not uniform, but unified. And, and, our, and our unity is based on this. It is Jesus who saves. It is Jesus who gives us a life spirit, giving spirit. It is Jesus whose example we're going to follow. It is Jesus who is the standard and nothing else. Nothing else. And whatever hope this world has, and I think it has hope, rests in the beating one heart of what Jesus calls his church. Sometimes, church, sometimes, we need radical heart surgery so we can beat as one. So we can be the beacon of hope for the world. So we can be the presence of God in the world. So we can be the voice of God in the world. Wow.
Maybe it's time for heart surgery. Let's pray. Father God, make us one. Give us a focus that is directed only on Jesus, who is the beginning and end of our faith, who is our supreme example in how to live and how to love and how to serve. May we be humble. And may our hearts, as your body, as the body of your Son, may our hearts beat as one. And may the world know that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and reigns forever and saves eternally. It's through him we pray that. So come on. How about a heart transplant today? If you've never surrendered your will to Jesus, today is the perfect day. Paul says today is the day of salvation, right? To offer up your will to God and let God's will reign supreme in your life. To tell everybody you believe that Jesus is Lord. To die to yourself, to be buried with him and meet him in in the tomb of baptism to receive his spirit, to be made new. There's the new heart and the new spirit. And then it'll start beating differently. And the world will look different. And that opportunity is yours. Uh, It is a hard world. There's pain. And there's hardship. And there's difficulties. But we got each other. And that's what we're here for. So if you have a need this morning, our elders are going to be at the back. Please see one of them. Let's stand and sing. Merciful God and Father, loving us like no other, hear our prayer, the cry of our hearts, as we come to you.
I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love me as much as you love me. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, and because of the suffering of death, so that he by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which are script, scriptures we're all familiar with. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. As oft, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself, then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For who, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Pray with me. Most gracious and holy God, we come to you thanking you for Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread, help us all to think back to Jesus and think about Jesus and think about his time on earth and all the good things that he did. As for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Will you pray with me again? Most gracious God, we thank you for Jesus giving his blood, that through this blood we might be redeemed with you. Heavenly Father, help us to always, each day and each moment of our lives, remember you and Jesus. For this we pray in his name. Amen. Will you pray with me again? Most gracious God, we realize that everything we have comes from you and actually belongs to you because we can only use it for a little while while we're on her. Heavenly Father, help us now to think about that and help us to return a portion of that to you to, with cheerful hearts. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I first want to remind you that on Saturday, August the 12th, there will be a men's breakfast in the fellowship hall. And JT Benton, is JT here? JT would like to have RSVPs. He, he has uh, signaled that he's going to be giving out $100 bills <laughs> to to every man that shows up for the breakfast, and he wants to make sure that his stack of $100 bills is adequate. So if you'll RSVP for that to JT, then he will, he will certainly have us covered. You know, uh, 1967, December, I think, 1967, was the first heart transplant where a heart was taken out of one person and transplanted by a group of surgeons into another human being. I think, I think since that time, that's maybe occurred several, several times over the course of history. And since the theme is heart, one heart, or a new heart, I was mindful that my doctor talks to me about a heart healthy diet. Have y'all heard about that? A heart, <laughs> yeah, he, they talked to me about it. I'm not sure I'm really good at it, but for this week, I, I think it's probably appropriate if we're gonna leave here with a new heart or a changed heart or a transformed heart that we ought to go out and take care of it this week. So I'm gonna give you something to take with you. 
that hopefully will be a heart healthy diet for you to live on this coming week. And I, I think it's appropriate that I give you something to help you remember this as you go through the week. So I'm going to give you these three letters. P M S P M S So this week this is going to help you remember this. To keep your faith and your heart strong this week, start with the break, the very basics. Pray. That's the P. Pray. When you talk to God, your heart becomes healthier. Your mind becomes healthier along the way. So pray this week. M, meditate. Fix your mind upon God. And the best way to fix your mind upon God, in my belief, is to read his word. Meditate upon the word of God in order to keep your heart growing and healthy for God this week. If you're not sure where to start because the book is big and it's long, start in John and just take in a little bit at a time reading the Gospel of John. P M the S is serve. Serve others. Whenever I serve others, I always get a joyful feeling in my heart. I bet you do too. When our hearts are set on Jesus, we won't be able to keep ourselves from serving others and sharing the good news of the gospel. So this week, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and your heart will be happy, healthy, and full of joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, transform us and transform our hearts too to be set upon you, dear Lord, and the salvation that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. This week, set us out and sustain the hope that is made available through Jesus Christ so that we will make our hearts refreshed, make our hearts stronger, and make our hearts new as we pray to you, as we meditate upon your word, and as we serve others while loving them towards Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I think we're going to have a scripture. Chris, you want people standing up for this? Let's all stand. Let's all stand. As for me, I, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. And from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.